Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this new America event for the launch of the Abu Dhabi Express, assessing UAE support for the Wagner Group. The report went live about three hours ago, or two hours ago online. I do hope you'll get a chance to, to check it out today. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by the report's three authors, Candace Rondu, the director of the Future, of Future Frontlines at New America, uh, Jack Margolin, program director at C4ADS, and Oliver Imhoff, a freelance investigative journalist. And my name is Amy McKinnon. I'm a national security reporter with Foreign Policy Magazine. So by way of introduction, I think, to the event today, um, you know, quite often as journalists, we put stories out into the ether and we have no way of knowing who's read them or where they've gone or whether they've even had any impact. And about this time last year, my colleague, Jack Detch, who's our Pentagon reporter, and I we put out a report I put out a story which was based on a single line buried on like page 40 something of a uh, Pentagon Inspector General report, um, which assessed, which included an assessment from the Defense Intelligence Agency that the UAE may be providing some financing for the Wagner Group's operations in Libya. And of course, this was at a time when there was a lot of scrutiny of a 23 billion armed package uh, lined up to, to, to go to the UAE. And so, you know, we thought this was relevant, this was interesting, we put the story out and that was that. But but little did I know that Candace, Jack and Oliver had, had, had grabbed onto that line from that Pentagon Inspector General report and dived into it using a whole range of open source data, customs records, social media, to really assess what that relationship is between the Wagner Group and the UAE in Libya. You know, what, what are the transport links and whether there is any financing going on there. So I'm really excited to be here today for the launch of this report. Um, and just before we begin, um, I just want to read you what I thought was the most striking line for me from the report, just to kind of give you all a sense of, of the context and the magnitude. And that is that Russia, a permanent member of the UN Security Council with tremendous sway over the outcome of conflicts around the world has developed a seemingly durable model for conducting war on the cheap in contravention of international law and a breach of UN resolutions. And it has done so with the help of an ostensible American ally. So um, right before we begin, I just wanna remind you that you can submit your own question for our guests today. We'll get to that in about the, the, th the third section of the hour today. Um, you can use the slide box to, to the right on the platform through which you're viewing us. So Candice, Oliver, Jack, Welcome, um, really excited to hear from you all. Um, I wanna begin with a kind of a, a, a question of, of context to kind of set the scene for what we're looking at today. And I'll, I think I'll start with you, Candice. Can you just describe for our audience watching at home, um, you know, what are the interests of Russia and, and, and the Wagner Group in Libya? And what are the interests of the UAE? And, and how did these seemingly align? Yeah, thanks, Amy. I, you know, uh, we've been hearing about the Wagner Group for so long, and and you know, for the last three or four years, there's been so much reporting out of Ukraine, out of Syria, um, and there, this is kind of like a new chapter in some ways for some people who are less familiar with um, Russia's interests in, in the Middle East generally. But um, what we know is that you know there's been a long-term relationship between the UAE and Russia, um, dating back to all the way to the Soviet times in terms of arms production. Um, you know, support for um, development of the oil and gas industry in, in sort of the Middle East region more generally. Um, so there's a lot of synergies between Russia and the UAE that have been longstanding. And we tend to kind of forget that, right? Because, um, you know, for so long, the U.S. was the dominant player in the Middle East. And these relationships, you know, with Gulf countries in particular have been very much defined by uh, predominantly the, the Iraq war, but then later, of course, the Syria war. And we tend to forget that there is this kind of other set of uh, mutual interests between these two countries. And as far as Libya goes, of course, um, it was the first to fall uh, in, during the Arab Spring and was a trigger point in many ways for Putin in particular, uh, which I think you know, sort of unleashed this kind of almost regret uh, and, a, and a pivot policy-wise in terms of cooperating with other UN Security Council partners on interventions. And it certainly um, embittered him a great deal uh, in terms of the promises that were made and seemingly broken. And that shift also happened to happen in tandem uh, with what I think many in, in the Gulf states, particularly the UAE, perceived as a, as a threat to their own uh, governments, their own regimes. Um, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, 
um, as well as you know, the, the prospect of their rise uh, in Libya and other places, and of course in Syria, was something that kind of kind of forced these um, these synergies um, to the center of the relationship. And um, and I think the U.S. was a little bit distracted uh, at the time, uh, you know, in terms of what to do, how to do it, and how to respond. So that's kind of the scene setter, the context. Um, but then additionally, of course, the UAE is not a big country; it doesn't have a giant army, and so it has relied oftentimes, uh, you know, certainly we know in Yemen in the context there. Uh, on mercenaries from Sudan and other countries, it should be no surprise to us that they have also found um, a pathway to mercenary support in, in Libya. I think what is unique, of course, uh, and what really stands out, what stood out to us, is that you know the Wagner Group is a group that is sanctioned. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the ostensible financier, uh, has been sanctioned by the U.S. and the EU. Um, so the UAE is taking taking a really big risk in cooperating. Um, or seemingly cooperating on the delivery of, of weapons and, and men into a theater that also is under UN embargo. Um, so lots of overlapping synergies and interests, but also lots of risks for the two countries. Mm -hmm. And Oliver, can you um, just talk us through, you know, at what point does the Wagner Group appear in Libya? And at what point did, did we begin to see suggestions that there's cooperation with the UAE there? Uh, so the Wagner Group appeared around uh, mid-2019 in Libya, um, and then at some point we already started seeing uh, early Turkish and GNA airstrikes on, on Wagner positions in south of Tripoli. Um, and uh, the, um, the Wagner um, um, Uh, sorry, what was, what was the second question? The UAE. When does the when does the UAE uh, start to come into the picture? Um, yeah, the uh, the UAE came into the picture when we started to see the the Pantheon air defense systems appearing around there. Uh, at the beginning, it only looked like the Pantheons were um, uh, did belong to the Wagner Group. Uh, but then at some point we started seeing that uh, some of them had a, had a chassis that was only used by the UAE, others had a chassis that what was only used by uh, by Russia. So we uh, started seeing at that, at that point that there was something going on. Uh, there were also several air bases in, in Libya that were previously controlled by the UAE mostly. Uh, so Al Khadim Air Base uh, or Jufra Air Base. Uh, and then at some point um, we started uh, seeing Russian personnel and then later also Russian airplanes there, uh, which was also um, pointed out by AFRICOM on Twitter. So Jack, how did you go about starting to assess this relationship? What, what sources do you go to for this? And, and how do you even begin to unspool that? So early on, uh, I mean, Candace and I have been talking about sort of different ways to pick apart the logistics pipeline behind Wagner, which I think is one of the most interesting but poorly understood part of that group's operations. How does a internationally active mercenary army manage to sustain itself abroad, especially when we understand that it has some overlap with the Russian state. What can that tell us about the relationship of Russian security services and this ostensibly private company or group of companies, right? Um, so because of that, we're already looking at this. What we kind of started with here was where, where logistics activities needed to touch on sort of international systems of trade and finance, right? So that included looking at things like flight data and customs data, um, basically where people or material were being moved. Um, in terms of looking at people, uh, C4DS had already been doing a, a good bit of work on looking at flight data going into and out of Libya. Um, we did that in, for the support of the UN panel of experts on Libya um, in support of some other media partners um, over the last couple of years. Um, and of course, a lot of that is built on a great work that's being done by a larger OSINT community, right? So if, if you go on Twitter, you'll find people like Il Kangaroo and Gurjan and others who I can name by handle, um, who have done outstanding work on this. And I think really like a larger sort of policy community owes a lot to these folks for shedding light on this activity. Um, that helped us to understand 
uh, Russian traffic into the UAE, particularly where ostensibly private aircraft were being used to move men and material. It helped us understand that from the UAE side and it helped us understand that as well from the Turkish side. What you see in the report is really a focus on the UAE and that's very intentional because we were interested in specifically how this pipeline moved from Russia to the UAE to Libya. Um, kind of chaining back from that air traffic and making reference to something Oliver alluded to, which is the additional focus on the Pantsir anti-air systems. We had seen this signature um, of kind of, uh, of these, these Pantsirs that we knew had been sold by Russia to the UAE and were being deployed in Libya. Um, there were some sort of signals that there, these were being operated by Wagner personnel that I think Candace and Oliver can describe better than I can. There is a very sort of striking shot of one that has some ruins drawn on the side of it, which is of course a, is an interesting signal to a lot of folks in this community that um, tend to watch Russian mercenary activity. Um, so we wanted to understand the entirety of this chain, having already gotten a picture of part of how Russia and the UAE are able to deniably transfer uh, personnel and material into Libya. We trace that back further using customs data and contract databases to make sense of how, uh, and specifically in Russia, the Tula Design Bureau had sold Pantsir anti-air systems uh, to the UAE. That gives us an idea of the scale of that trade. That gives us an idea of the period that that trade was occurring um, and the types of components that might be sent on later after the fact. So. Um, without getting too into the gory details of what that actually consisted of, we can see exactly how much these components cost. It gives us probably not a comprehensive picture because some of this trade is military-related trade, so it's likely to have gaps in the publicly available information. But we can see, for example, that Russia and specifically the Tula Design Bureau is sending through specific private companies um, these components for Pantsir anti-air systems that include radar components, uh, different components for onboard computers, et cetera. We can see the sort of pace at which that happened. We can see it happening up until February of this year. So a lot of different elements here in terms of where this logistics chain attaches between these different parties and how something, a piece of hardware that starts off in Russia ends up in Libya. But that was where we kind of started from. And then we tied that together with the, 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 the context of what we knew of the sort of defense relationship here. And of course, the, the work that Candace and Oliver have done to shed light on how these, these systems were actually deployed in the field and how that changed facts on the ground. So Candace, why are they going to all this bother to, sh to ship things via the UAE to set up these back channels? Why not just fly them straight from Russia to Libya? Well, I mean, partly because of course the UN embargo raises the risk for both Russia and the UAE or anybody who is supplying combatants in the Libyan theater. Um, and even though, of course, you know, the UN put out a report uh, earlier this year that, you know, basically called out all of the players, you know, from Turkey to uh, Russia to the UAE and others, uh, Egypt even, um, for, you know, busting the embargo, sending weapons and men into the, into the theater. And it's, it's almost impossible now to really say that there is a working, you know, embargo in, in the Libyan case. Um, but the reason they're going to this trouble is because Nonetheless, um, a, a sort of bold, open transfer of uh, men and, and weapons into that kind of theater uh, would certainly elevate the issue at the UN Security Council level, um, would make them sort of open to potential uh, accusations of breach of sovereignty. Um, you name it, the list is long and the risks are high for both countries, any country really filtering, um, sending uh, material into to a country like that. But, I think they also, you know, in the in Russia's case, um, you have two different kind of prior experiences that have informed the kind of uh, the push for deniability. So first is Ukraine, and that's the the most obvious case where um, it was a bit difficult <laughs> to deny um, the presence of of Russian uh, security forces. Uh, very early, you know, it became very clear that there was a challenge. But you know, the downing of MH17 in 2015, 2014, early in the beginning of the Crimean and Donbass war um, was a big um, sea change for how the EU in particular viewed Russia. Um, it also led to a, a massive sanctions from both the United States and the EU and really kind of started this chain effect where it was very clear that any kind of um, open proof 
that Russia was supplying combatants uh, that were not within its constitutional chain was going to be problematic for the Russian government and for the Russian economy. Um, and then, and then Syria pops. Um, I should say Syria has already popped, right? The civil war has already begun. Uh, Russia already has a military presence at, uh, in, in Tartu at the uh, naval base there. Uh, and already had a private security contractor presence in the oil and gas fields, just from, again, legacy projects that they had um, and deals that they had with the Assad regime. And it really kind of all, all of this kind of Wagner group mythology begins to kick off um, after the interdictions that begin, um, the UK and the US uh, and a couple other NATO partners bonded together and began interdicting shipments of weapons and goods on what is known as the Syria Express. And it was those early incursions and in, 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 uh, interdictions around Cyprus uh, and Turkey and then across uh, near the Libyan coast as well. So basically the Eastern Med um, where essentially that sort of set off this new chain of interest in making sure that there is even greater deniability. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, some of the elements of, um, of the kind of cooperation between Russia vis-a-vis -vis these uh, private security contingents are pretty obvious. Um, you know, when you really think about it, um, if you're moving a giant weapons platform like, you know, a Pantsir into a country, um, it's got to have a physical footprint, right? It has to be traceable on some level. And, you know, what we learned very quickly was this is an old deal. I mean, this goes back to the late 1990s, really, when the UAE was, again, just beginning to kind of grow its, its military um, forces, trying to modernize them and um, kind of position them within the region. Uh, and Russia was, like France, like the United States, only too happy to sell um, weapons, right? Uh, and the, but the interesting part about Russia's kind of deal making with the UAE at that time uh, is that, of course, the UAE did have a lot of debt. And um, this is one of the things, one of the signatures that we see in all of Russia's relationships with um, countries where they deploy the Wagner Group uh, is there is some sort of prior debt service deal where essentially Russia writes off the debt in exchange for an agreement, um, whether it's you know, soft or then later hardened through a military technical agreement uh, to facilitate the support of arms development uh, either in that country or with Russia um, and then becoming a permanent customer uh, of, of Russia for, for arms. And so that's where this really begins with a $734 million deal uh, that was hatched in, I guess it was 1993 initially and then kind of grew over time. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, and if you think about sort of, you know, each Pantsir is probably worth about $15 million a piece. Um, you don't just sort of make those things and then deploy them. You have to train people to use them. Um, and you have then think, well, what, in what context would the UAE ever use a Pantsir? Um, unless it was in some sort of context of a, you know, a, a pretty big war. Um, and right now we don't see that directly in the Gulf, right? Um, and so in, in a way, this is kind of surplus material um, that has kind of evolved out of this relationship that goes back to the 1990s. Interesting. Now, Oliver, what do we know about who's offering the panzers on the, who's offering the panzers on the ground in Libya? Uh, so that has always been a bit opaque. Um, panzers aren't easy to operate. Um, so we assume that the crews are mostly Russian or people who know how to deal with them, uh, which also led us to the Wagner group being involved here. Um, on the other hand, we also saw that uh, we also saw that some of the panzers were extremely poorly operated because so many were lost in airstrikes. Uh, so we assume also from from manuals that were found with LNA forces and so on later when they have to withdraw from Tripoli uh, that LN LNA troops were operating the panziers but um, were extremely poorly advised in how to actually use them. Uh, that's why so many losses occurred. Mm -hmm. And um, Jack, I wanna go back to you on, you know, on this kind of air bridge that was set up between the UAE and Libya. Um, I, one of the more striking things I think in the report is that, that C-17s, the US made C-17s were used as part of this air bridge. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um... So the, the air bridge that the UAE maintained with Libya, again, I should say with all this, like you can see an airplane moving, you don't know what's on board, right? 
So certainly by no means mean to imply that like we're looking at customs data, we see Pantsir components get sent to the, the UAE and then we're able to see that get loaded onto a C-17 or something. That's, that's not it. But we, we are able to understand as part of how the UAE has built this deniable sort of logistics chain um, into Libya. I say deniable, but like, as we've seen, it's evolved over time, right? So attempting to use ostensibly private aircraft, like Genus Air, Maximus Air, a score of other uh, uh, private sort of wet lease charter companies that have been cited in UN panel reports. Because those are cited in UN panel reports, they've been exposed. So um, we've seen over time that uh, the UAE has kind of tended more towards using actual military aircraft. I think that this idea of using private airlift didn't quite provide the level of opacity that they'd hoped for, um, largely because like we're in a world now where you have a dozen people on Twitter that are tracking this stuff and trying to make sense of it. Um, so within that context, we see the UAE starting to use some US manufactured C-17 cargo planes. Um, now this is obviously very interesting to us. And again, I, I stress that we don't know what's on board these planes, but what we do know is that in, particular during our sort of period of study here, which is around January to July, 2020, um, we see 12 different flights where we can confirm that UAE C-17s took this really high risk trip. And what I mean by high risk trip is not that I see a, a C-17 leave out of Abu Dhabi and then you know land in Benghazi. Um, there's a little bit more savvy than that. And the data is unfortunately not quite so clean. But what we can see is that these aircraft depart from the UAE, and then they fly to an area where they, they tend to drop off a reception of ADSB that is consistent with flights to either high risk air bases in Western Egypt uh, or, in, or, or in Eastern Libya. Um, so that tells us that these are the most likely flights that pose a risk of being UAE supply of material, weapons, et cetera, into Libya. It's not conclusive, but it does give us an idea, and particularly when we look at it uh, in, in sort of like the larger scale. So. Within that same period, there's an additional 52 flights of concern by some of those private airlines that I mentioned earlier, Genus Air, Arazi, FlySky. Um, and they're flying much the same pattern that these UAE C-17s are. To make matters more complicated, this is not the full picture of C-17 air traffic into Libya in that period. Um, while we have a lot of questions that remain about where these C-17s might have landed after they flew this sort of high-risk journey, we have some, we can make some inferred guesses based on timeline and when they returned. It's, likely that they flew somewhere within a specific radius. It's extremely likely that they landed in Western Egypt or Eastern Libya. Um, we also know from the work of some other researchers that uh, a score of other C-17s made a similar journey, um, but without tracking themselves uh, on, on ADS-B. So they, they didn't broadcast their coordinates um, through the system that is traditionally used to monitor aircraft and air traffic. That's not totally unusual for a military aircraft. Um, but they did broadcast enough information that we're able to tell which receiver picked them up, right? So an antenna on the ground that picks up the signal from this aircraft, we can tell which one did. And based on that, we can get a very rough idea, 150 to 200 miles of, of where this aircraft might've been. And based on that, um, some other researchers, and, and again, I referenced Gurjan earlier, this again goes credit to, to him, uh, an independent researcher on Twitter, um, identified about an an additional 48 flights that he assessed as high risk based on based on how he was able to identify their location. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a measurement of risk, not certainty. Um, we have more certainty from things like satellite imagery that show these C-17s landing at airfields like uh, Sidi Barani and in Western Egypt. But all of that is details on the investigation. What does that actually tell us? That tells us that American-made military hardware and selling to UAE um, is being used in extremely high risk activity um, that may include violations of the UN arms embargo, right? Um, now, even if we can't confirm that, it's definitely still very interesting and something that we should continue to monitor. Um, particularly, how does the balance of using these military aircraft balance with uh, using these ostensibly private operators um, that are involved in the same activity? It's worth kind of pointing out also, if I can jump in here, um, I mean, you know, we, we mentioned this in the report that, um, and again, we, we cannot connect all the dots. Uh, we need to be really clear that, um, you know, we're not looking at causation or even necessarily correlation, except we're noticing patterns um, that are interesting to us that seem to have some sort of alignment. So um, one of the things that's really notable in the customs data that we looked at 
is that there is this seeming uptick in you know roughly the kind of December, uh, January, February period when there's a ceasefire called uh, in 2020, just a brief one um, before the big one uh, that we're now sort of, I guess, sort of sitting in right now. Um, but there was this kind of a small little window there of roughly three months where we saw um, more orders seemingly for more of this pan material. Um, and I think if we, if we probably you know, had a little bit more time uh, and a little bit more sort of resources, maybe some better satellite imagery, we might, we might've been able to kind of sort of assess actually, well, um, you know, is, is there any relationship between the tempo of flights during this time which also seem to have an increase during that period. And then the customs data showing that there are these sort of pan -seer replacement materials, radar, you know, electronic equipment and so forth. Uh, and also, you know, the casualty rates that we also track, right? Because we also saw, as Oliver mentioned, um, yes, of course, there were strikes um, where we think potentially the LNA was uh, operating the pan -seers, um, but we also have documented it in the report uh, well over 42 you know, Wagner casualties themselves, including some of the commanders. And when we looked even closer at sort of like, well, who are these guys exactly? Like, what are their qualifications? And, it, you know, what jumps out at you, of course, is that a lot of them are electronic warfare specialists. Uh, one in particular jumped out at us as somebody who had trained in Kaliningrad. So this is the kind of person you would expect to be on the ground operating, you know, these types of air defense mechanisms. Um, so there's so many different overlaps here that raise our curiosity, but of course, a lot more work and research would need to, need to be done. What does this tell us about the effectiveness of sanctions regimes that, you know, Libya is under a, a UN embargo, that Prigozhin's network of companies have been repeatedly sanctioned by the US Treasury, and yet I noted in the report that the two, uh, the two companies which were involved in those logistics network are not sanctioned, even though they've been known to transport equipment to eastern Ukraine or to transport something to Eastern Ukraine, to the Donbass. I mean, what does that tell us? I mean, from my perspective, and I know Jack has his own views, um, you know, it shows how difficult it is, right, to, to implement uh, a set of laws like CATSA, right, which is the Countering uh, America's Adversary uh, Act, which is, of course, the sanctions on Russia and others. Um, you know, you have to get pretty granular, uh, and there has to be kind of almost a political will to get that granular, right? The question is, you know, we've talked a lot in the context of Russian sanctions about that one rung further up the chain, which would be, of course, targeting uh, the sovereign wealth fund of Russia, um, you know, looking at the, uh, the express wealth of, or suspected wealth of, you know, different high flyers within the Russian regime. Uh, that's another kind of no-go zone that we haven't you know, seen the United States go to yet. I mean, that's great. That's really high stakes stuff. But it, I, my suspicion is that actually uh, a much more kind of considered and systematic approach to understanding the supply chains would actually net you a little bit more in terms of actually stopping, um, you know, the, the transfers of men and materiel into some of these combat zones of concern. But I think Jack probably has some views as well. Yeah, thank you, Candice. Um, I think that, yes, yeah, especially what you just mentioned on the logistics chain. Um, I'm totally in agreement there. And I'll just kind of hop in from that perspective is I, what we're seeing here by both Russia and the UAE is like, you know, mercenary activity is not new, right? That's the, the profession as old as time. Um, deniable, plausible deniability of military activity is not new. We saw that throughout the Cold War. Um, it looks different today because the world and global finance are more interconnected. And also because people like ourselves are able to get a better vantage on that type of activity. So. There are more avenues for countries like the UAE and Russia to conduct this activity, but they also have to be more considerate of how they're hiding that activity because it's a bit easier to detect. So explosion of data to hide in, but also for us to search through, right? Um, what this says to me and what I think kind of based on our organizational approach this means is we need to be more sophisticated in how we're trying to detect this activity. Detecting like what I think would broadly term gray zone activity is really hard because it is, you have to distinguish illicit commercial activity from an entire universe of illicit commercial activity. So there, I think there needs to be an additional focus on methods to do that, to find that needle in the haystack. Um, and this report, I think, gives some examples of, of how that can work in practice. Um, and then in the implementation of, of that analysis, really looking at this with a broader toolkit, right? So um, treasury sanctions are one tool. 
there are a lot of different considerations in their use. They're not the only financial measure that is available to us, particularly if we're focusing on logistics chains, which I think are the most vulnerable parts of these networks. Um, C4's, uh, C4DS's experience with uh, sort of earlier reports, for example, the Odessa network, which um, recently I think had its, its birthday. Uh, it's a report that's been out for, I think at this point, almost was five, six years. Um, that looked at how Russia was using private companies to move uh, men and material into Syria um, and how they were doing that deniably and uh, how a number of those companies had lots of licit business. And through exposing those companies and through um, sharing that information broadly and with, with private sector and government, we were able to contribute to a campaign that resulted in a lot of those companies um, being unable to continue to take part in that activity, or at least not at the same scale. Um, so I think that the, the emphasis that I would that I would put on is really analytically thinking about exploiting the full scope of publicly available data, because that's where these types of networks are hiding, and that's where they're discoverable. And then thinking about a broader range of tools, and that includes not only OFAC sanctions, but also Bureau of Industry and Security entity listing, coordination with partners in the European Union, um, something we've seen with some of these airlines is removal of them, their removal from civil aviation registries and loss of their uh, aviation licenses in the countries in which they're based. Keeping these networks on the off foot, um, because while they're adaptable, um, you, and, and to use a kind of casual term here, like you can waste their time, right? You can make it more expensive for them to operate. You can make their life a lot harder. And for some of these folks, particularly illicit entrepreneurs, you don't want to stay in a business if it's not profitable and if you've just made it really painful for them. Um, so you can close a lot of the options that are available to these networks. That makes sense. Um, I can see audience questions are starting to trickle in. And so a reminder to everyone that um, in about kind of 10, 15 minutes, we'll, we'll start to get to your questions. So, so please keep sending them in. Uh, Oliver, I, I want to come back to you. I mean, how how were you able to study who the Wagner fighters are, and what do we know about you know how many are there and and how many losses they had? Uh, so there are different methods. Um, so there's been a lot of reporting in the Libyan media about them. Uh, there were a lot of reports, um, probably taken by by citizen who uh, citizens who posted pictures on social media of of fighters they spotted were pretty easy, uh, easily identifiable because they usually got more so sophisticated uh, fighting gear than Libyan fighters um, and also physically more recognizable. Um, so that was one thing that was posted on, on social media. Um, then uh, Russian media that was uh, that's more critical of the Kremlin like Medusa or Novaya Gazeta, they, um, they usually wrote a lot of stories about Wagner. And um, yeah, you could find plenty of information there because they got more information on the Russian side of things. Uh, so they actually had the, um, they had the opportunity uh, to research within the country. Um, and then we also cooperated with the BBC investigation that came out a few months back. Um, we actually went into Libya and found the Wagner tablet um, and found information about various fighters in there as well. Um, so that's always different sides to the investigation. And um, yeah, some of the fighters particularly struck us. Um, there was, for example, uh, Alexander Kuznetsov, um, who uh, was pictured in a, uh, in a photo with Vladimir Putin before in, in a state visit. Um, he allegedly has some connections with the neo-pagan scene in Russia um, that's sort of in the new fascist spectrum as well. Uh, then there was another fighter uh, who's called Vadim Bekshinev, uh, uh, of which a form was found, um, also credit cards, other personal belongings and so on. So there was pretty extensive information about him out there that was also uncovered by Libyan media. Um, and then, for example, there was also uh, Gleb Mostov, um, who was reported by a Russian local newspaper from his area uh, when he died in Libya. And um, yeah, there were uh, so that like shows you the local aspect of reporting there. You mentioned that you know at least some of them have been found through their their kind of social media presence to have an affinity for the far right. Um, I mean that is deeply concerning, the thought of, 
you know, untracked mercenaries operating in a war-torn country. I mean, what do we know about their, their ideology? Is that widespread throughout the Wagner fighters? Well, first of all, what is Wagner, right? I mean, Wagner, we have to talk about it. For, what is it exactly? I mean, it's, it's a contingent, a set of contingents um, that are deployed with, you know, certain military technical agreements as the umbrella and or uh, certain oil and gas uh, agreements under, you know, a, an umbrella with a given regime. We've seen that in Syria. Uh, we've seen that in CAR and elsewhere. So it's important to kind of understand kind of like, what are these contingents exactly? Um, so most definitely, you know, in some of the social media that we have been collecting for a very long time um, through our work at Future Frontlines and our cooperation with ASU and a couple of other partners, um, you know, contact you, you know, Telegram, a couple other um, social media sites are very big sources of information because they love to talk about their exploits. Um, and what we found, um, you know, Jack referenced earlier uh, one of the photos that's been out there. It's been you know floating around for a while now uh, of a, a pan seared cab that had a Viking ruin on it, basically. And what we know is that there's a, a subgroup you know known as Rusic that operates out of St. Petersburg, one of the first contingents to show up uh, in in, WAG, in, in uh, Ukraine and then later in Syria. Um, we know that there are sort of these interpersonal connections in large part because there's overlapping um, prior service in certain types of uh, airborne units. So the Vade Vey um, Airborne Service um, tends to attract a certain type of folks um, who would have this kind of forward operating reconnaissance type mission in their past training. Um, and so some of these folks um, seem to have either overlapping former commanders, um, uh, Jed Moroz, as it were, sort of the, the, the uncle that kind of takes care of them in the military. Uh, and, and some of them also, um, you know, clearly have a, a long-term affinity. Um, there's a big, I think, node in St. Petersburg where we have seen overlapping friendship ties, um, not just, you know, via their sort of social media follower friend um, platform, but literally via pictures that they've taken in places with each other or videos. Um, where we've seen, for instance, Alexander Borodai, uh, who was the former uh, Minister of Defense, uh, Prime Minister, I should say, of, uh, in Donbass for a brief period, you know, appearing in, in videos with Rusic members who were also in Syria, we believe also in Libya. Um, again, there's this kind of uh, ideological melding of folks who are sort of pro-Russian nationalists, but you have to make some distinctions. Uh, some are more oriented toward this kind of neo-pagan, fascististic, um, you know, old school revival of, of Nazi ideals, which is odd to think about it for Russians, but true. Um, and then some are more oriented toward um, kind of reviving the imperial empire. Uh, and again, there's a lot of overlap there in St. Petersburg between these groups that we've seen online. Uh, and I think that, yes, it is extremely frightening uh, to think about them being deployed out uh, into war zones, um, although maybe also not surprising, um, because these are guys who potentially have also experienced trauma uh, in their prior military service um, and kind of continue on in that vein, uh, but have now an ideology to rally around. To kind of jump in on that, and this is certainly not to, I, not to minimize anything that Candace has said. I think it is, it is difficult in some of these cases to distinguish. Um, earnestly held beliefs or people that are practicing religious, specifically like neo-pagan religious practices versus like also some of the imagery. Um, and something that's really challenging about that within this group is I, I can think of few communities that have developed such a strong and identifiable identity over such a relatively short period of time. Um, obviously they have a lot to draw off of. There's like sure huge elements of like the sort of US like operator imagery that gets pulled in. But then there's also this, as Candace refers to, like Rusich sort of neo-fascist imagery um, that really abounds. And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that this plays at least some role in informing conduct of these forces abroad. Um, that kind of goes beyond these guys wearing patches that might have like a, an awful ruin on them or something like that. Um, that includes things like you know, for example, we've seen there's graffiti that is it has some terms that I think would be we'd consider pretty fascistic or far right, um, or at the very least Islamophobic. Um, that these individuals have been photographed and that are ostensibly, you know, they've, they've done this in places like Syria and Libya. 
Um, and that's that's pretty alarming to us, but also, you know, it's, it's not inconsistent with what we can see in terms of their conduct regarding things like human rights abuses. I don't think there's any reason for us to believe that there's a whole lot of accountability for these forces. Um, and I think probably one of the, um, whether or not it's associated with a sort of affinity for the far right, um, there is certainly within these communities a culture of celebrating um, brutality and cruelty. Um, there's, a, I think, sort of a an outgrowth of like the worst parts of the internet that you see <laughs> among some of these guys, whether they be actual veterans of private military contractors or wannabes. Um, that is definitely, I think, something that should be concerning to us when we consider what type of impact even small contingents of Russian private military contractors will have on the ground, particularly in places that already have really horrible situations as regards human security and really vulnerable civilian communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have two more quick questions and then we'll, we'll get to our audience questions. Firstly, Jack, how does the networks that you identify in this report, how do they compare to other Wagner logistics support networks elsewhere in, in Africa or you know, Syria, other places that they operate? Uh, I can provide a very long winded answer to this and I will endeavor not to. Um, these are fairly distinct from others. Um, as, as Candace points out, um, it's really difficult to identify one thing as the Wagner group, right? Like, um, and I, I love saying this because like the one time I think Amy, you and I talked about this and I, I made some comment about like, there's no such thing as the Wagner group specifically. And then that was of course like quoted on like, you know, it wasn't South Front, but it was like a similar like Russian propaganda site. Not my point, right? There is no legal entity called the Wagner group. There are there Russian private military contractors that are engaged in activity, some of which may be illegal under international law abroad, definitely. Um, with that out of the way, uh, how this is distinct from other operations in, in Africa. Um, some of this is like, we don't know what we don't know, but what I can say from what we've studied in other places, the typical sort of MO or package that Wagner would, would offer really is establishment through a branch for the local company that's usually engaged in something involving resource extraction. I think that serves purposes that involve not only revenue generation, but it's also a really effective vehicle to have people in country. It gives you something to stamp on a visa and it gives you something with which to engage with local industry and politicians. So we see that everywhere from Madagascar, Central African Republic, they incorporate a local company and that company does some kind of business. Um, the other components here are political technologists to kind of use the Russian term, um, which are their sort of political consultants, most infamously Maxime Chevalier, who is now the subject of several unwatchable movies and is was in prison previously in Libya for doing sociological work, but as has been pretty well documented, was involved in political interference activities. A lot of these folks are uh, either associated with the Internet Research Agency or they're part of a larger sort of core of St. Petersburg's St. Petersburg based political consultants in Russia. And then finally, there's the military component. And this piggybacks on top of that sort of more commercial slash political interference side of things. They will use a lot of the same logistics, but they will not have quite the same level of footprint and publicly available information. They're a little bit harder to detect. They're, they're, they're smart in that regard, right? Libya is strange because there's a whole lot of two and three and not a whole lot of one. So there's a lot more visible sort of involvement of political technologists and, and military forces or, you know, combatants essentially, and a lot less of the sort of commercial engagement, at least that's available in publicly available information. And what that could suggest to us is either a different MO, or it could simply suggest that they're learning from experience, that this makes them very detectable and they need to approach engagement in other countries differently than they have in the past. Um, I think that there's arguments for both. Um, but I'd say that other things that kind of help us distinguish this, which again, I'm sure that Candace and Oliver can kind of speak more to this. Um, some of what we see in terms of activity in Libya is very different from what we see in other places, um, specifically when we talk about operating Pantsir anti-air systems, operating uh, MiGs and Sukhois. Um, you don't see that level of hardware or that's, that hardware that is that sophisticated or expensive being operated by these guys and a lot of other theaters. Um, and that to me is really interesting when taken in, in the context of um, different sort of commercial models for their engagement. Um, but again, we don't know what we don't know. There's, it's possible that there is a larger commercial footprint that's not visible in publicly available information, but they do seem to be leaning a lot more on Russian sort of state-owned assets, the 223rd, 223rd, 224th flight wing. 
rather than uh, private companies to transfer this stuff. I mean, there's probably also, I mean, just another potential option to think about is, you know, in the case of Libya, most of the, the leading players uh, who were in the oil and gas industry were actually, you know, they had to leave, uh, exit very quickly um, when the Libyan revolution popped off. And, you know, so Tatneft, I think they extracted like 300 to 400 uh, of their own staff out of the country, um, and which was the major player in, in, uh, in Libya at the time in terms of oil resources and oil deals and, and gas deals. So Libya is a little bit different than Syria and, and even maybe the CAR or other places in the sense that um, there was so much decimation there at the outset of the civil war that there wasn't really a means by which they could actually kind of jump up a force uh, very quickly because they just didn't have that relationship. And I, I, I would say, uh, I think it's relatively clear. Uh, there are some pretty good hints that, um, that the financing of certain types of infrastructure uh, in, in Libya um, under various factions and then the destruction of that infrastructure um, has its own kind of paying price in terms of reinsurance and what we would call war insurance, basically. Uh, this is a theory I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, one way to kind of finance a, a group of uh, mercenaries where you don't have access to, necessarily have access to um, oil and gas resources is to find ways to, to launder money um, and to kind of pump up value in things that get destroyed uh, is one way to do that. But let's not forget also that um, there was a blockade that uh, on, on oil resources in the east of uh, Libya for quite some time. Uh, and that blockade certainly would have benefited anybody on the black market for bunkered oil, which is really key. I, I mean, I could keep you all talking all day about this, but I'll have one, one final question and I promise I will get to the audience questions. Um, Candice, is there any suggestion that the Russians are learning from their experience in, on, on the Libyan battlefield? Because you describe in the report how, you know, the Panziers really kind of gave the Wagner group and Haftar's forces an advantage until the Turkish drones came in and, and some of the Panziers were destroyed. I mean, are they using this to look at and say, okay, you know, these were destroyed, how can we make them more robust for future conflicts or testing, you know, kind of strategies and, and things like that? Oh yeah, that's definitely happening. I mean, in, in their own analysts, you know, some of the best in Moscow have openly written about this and talked about it and given interviews about what happened with the Panzer. So of course we saw first in Syria, a number of Israeli strikes uh, on Panziers, uh, clearly operated by the Russians uh, that were quite successful uh, that then kind of led to this shift and this up armoring for um, new radar equipment. Um, for whatever reasons, um, you know, it seems like uh, some of the Panzer platforms in uh, the Libyan theater didn't come equipped with that. I don't know if it's simply because the UAE um, just didn't build them out that way. Lots of different reasons we can think of. Uh, and that also would kind of then point to maybe some of the rationale behind this uptick in uh, orders for electronic radar or sensing equipment uh, that happened kind of mid-battle for, for Tripoli. Um, so one thing we've learned is that, yeah, Russia has announced that it is, you know, upgrading uh, the Panzer S1 uh, to the, I think it's a Panzer M, um, which is essentially making it more mobile, uh, more able to deal with drone swarms, incoming strikes, and so forth. Um, in theory, it should make it a better weapon, but of course that's expensive. Um, and so there's this, this really interesting kind of trade-off here. Uh, you know, when you do a deal where you have this synergy with a, uh, a country like UAE, you've got this prior existing uh, military technical agreement, um, you develop this material, this platform uh, in just such a way, but it's like it's kind of old now. <laughs> and so it starts to actually have an impact on what, you know, the reputation of that particular weapons platform. It's one of the things we found, of course, is that, um, you know, a couple of countries that Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, that would have normally been uh, a, a prime client for some of this, for a new set of panziers basically said, you know, we're out. Um, and that could be co a combination of things going on there, you know, sanctions, pressures from the United States and the EU, um, but also maybe the reputation of the performance in Libya uh, had some effect on depressing the demand. So I'm gonna to go to our audience questions now as, as promised. Um, the first one, 
uh, I think I will put to Jack, um, but feel free all of you to jump in on these. This, is, this comes from Matt Sutherland who says, do you think there's a danger in labeling semi-state forces like Wagner as a PMC, like lots of media love to do? That's a good question. Um, so hmm, semi-state forces, right? A lot of PMCs I think would probably fall into this category of boy, you'd sure like me to think you are a private company, but I, I know in my heart of hearts that you are nothing like what we would think of as a conventional private military contractor. Um, the way that I would characterize this is perhaps not as semi-state forces, um, although there is an undeniable, uh, I think, rationale for identifying them as such. But in making these distinctions, I would consider these as you have your sort of conventional private military and security company insofar as that is a category, which is, you know, principally large companies that, you, you know, there's plenty of them in the US, UK, around the world, you know, Triple Canopy, G4S, whoever, um, that, you know, run an effective business that's usually activities that are much more boring than the kinds of things that Wagner engages in, um, but are much more reliable and are much more licit. Um, and then there is this sort of there's this the community of, of, of malign private military and security companies, which are oftentimes smaller companies that you've never heard of. They're engaged in activity that we would consider something closer to mercenary activity. Um, it's a lot more high risk that involves a lot more combat arms as opposed to logistics. They're not there to clean latrines and cook food. They are there to, they're shooters. So that's obviously like a pretty simple distinction, I think, in some of these cases that we can kind of do based on Licit activity, less high risk, more high risk, and certainly illicit activity like violation of UN arms embargoes. Um, that is generally how I tend to bend these things. Uh, those are st still slippery concepts. It becomes more slippery still when we consider the fact that there is some Russian state support for these forces, right? Um, and we know that they are integrated with the Russian security services to varying degrees, depending on theater. The, the danger I think that we run of trying to lump in someone like Wagner um, or Russian private military forces in general overall with the Russian armed forces is that I, it, it's, it seems obvious, but the line is really blurred and I think it's different in different places. So I don't think that we can say that the level of command and control that uh, the Russian military exercises over private military companies in theaters like Syria is comparable to that that they exercise over them in places like Mozambique, for example. Um, so I think that we need to kind of maintain a spectrum with, with, within which we can classify that level of command and control. Um, I, might, I might differ a little bit on that. <laughs> I, think, yeah, is, I think I probably dis disagree on some of this, Candice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would just say that you have to kind of then think about like, okay, let's, let's think about all the touch points um, for the state in everything from recruitment to management, and I'm talking about just the HR side, and then, then look at the logistics chain, which we've been talking about you know, quite a bit here, um, and how many touch points you know, does the state have there? Uh, quite a few. So in each, in each category, which is like the men themselves, how they're recruited, how they're trained, how they're deployed, um, we know that the back end of this is um, what used to be called uh, Oboron uh, uh, on, which is like the, uh, sorry, the, the services arm of the Ministry of uh, Defense, which is now semi-privatized. Um, we know that um, to get those contracts, they have to go through the Ministry of Defense or Ministry of Emergencies. Um, and, and we know that most of them would have served at some prior time uh, in the Russian military. Um, the command and control, I think I would agree with you that there is a, there is kind of this logic skip there. We don't really understand what's going on. Um, and there have been clear situations like in Syria when there was the, the strike, US strike on that column of uh, Wagner fighters where there was clearly some sort of lack of coordination um, and communication uh, between official Russian control and then uh, the Wagner troops um, that kind of bedeviled them in some ways. Um, but then you look at the other touch points, which is like, well, um, you know, you're delivering large scale platforms like Pansiers, that's another state touch point. Uh, and we know that in, in the, each of these cases, uh, the Russian state's shareholder interest or stakeholder interest is pronounced. Um, the only thing that we're missing from the picture is a granular analysis of the executive orders that have been issued 
uh, since 2014, since the uh, first incursion in Ukraine. Uh, we know that there have been some, uh, and we know that they determined that there are certain strategic industries uh, that have to be protected and that they operate under these very loose letters of mark. Uh, you know, from an IHL perspective, um, there's really very little question that that, that, that level of um, state stakeholder interest uh, certainly suggests that there, these are state forces. So maybe maybe what we can arrive at in somewhere in a happy medium is what I have kind of used the shorthand here, which is that they're a a state leveraged illicit network. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we have a question from Mohammed who asks, "Did you come across any evidence that would potentially force the U.S. to prosecute UAE officials?" previous evidence has been ignored and impunity has typically prevailed. I mean, I th think you could kind of broaden this out and just, you know, what is the US response? You know, this is a sensible ally supporting a, a uh, as you outlined at the beginning of the report, this is an ally supporting an adversary, you know, in violation of UN embargoes. What are the consequences? I mean, there's some irony here, if you really think about it, like, the, you know, sanctions on uh, Turkey now considering uh, potentially sanctions on India, you know, two long time steadfast uh, allies that have actually even been in combat uh, in situations where US troops are in theater, um, a little bit different than the UAE, right? Like uh, not to say that there haven't been some sort of special forces um, coordination and cooperation in certain theaters, but um, certainly like a lesser uh, ally in the sense of just its scope and its size and its imprint and importance, I think. So, you, you know, I, I guess you have to ask the question, um, why not more scrutiny uh, in that case? Why treat, you know, these other allies differently when you've got some sort of clear indication from multiple different um, sources, even within the Pentagon, right? The UN, um, the State Department, you know, open source reporters and researchers like us um, are all kind of looking at this relationship and we've identified that there's something going on there. Um, as far as as far as proof, uh, I mean, this is that's for the courts. We don't we don't um, we don't deal in proof. We deal in in research and empiricism and try and sort of collect evidence where we can, where we see it. Um, I think really now it's up to you know others in this kind of policy community to consider um, their position at this stage. I think we have time for one more, um, and uh, I've lost track of where it was in the document. Um, we had a question about, where did it go, YouTube, yeah, from Pam Delar Delargy, who says the UAE has been supplying the Ethiopian government in the current civil war, you know, is the US, the US is concerned about the escalation of this conflict, why is the UAE persisting, so kind of a similar question there. Oh, Tigray, well, we have our suspicions about Tigray, but I think I'll let Jack speak to that. Um. I also am not going to get super deep into this because I think it is a it is deserving. If I'm going to talk about Tigray at all, and especially UAE involvement in Tigray, I'd better do it with enough rigor and depth. But I will. What I will say um, is to kind of allude to a point that I think has come up throughout this. Right. All right. So like we're talking about again what could broadly be termed sort of gray zone activity. Uh, I think the UAE is, is really good at this in ways that aren't fully appreciated. And we talk about this in the context a lot of obviously Russia, right? China. We don't really talk about the UAE in this context, even though in some ways I think they're more sophisticated and honestly have like a better approach almost to incubate um, sort of like innovative attempts at, it's a very free market for uh, potential sort of gray zone intervention, right? Um, so if we look at sort of past activities, um, to make reference to another set of potential um, illicit activities in Libya, um, UN reporting regarding um, OPUS, which was related to reflex response, which then relates back to Eric Prince and those operations. Um, that was in large part, um, as identified by previous UN panels, potentially an effort by the UAE to sort of incubate um, or patronize um, a a set of activities and entities that would explore the possibilities for deniable intervention, particularly in places like the Horn of Africa. Um, in addition to that, the UAE, due to its lack of transparency in some regards, is an ideal is an ideal jurisdiction for this type of activity. So 
the UAE is, has been, and I think will be into the future, one of the central hubs of illicit airlift, um, which it quite obviously is one of my bugbears, but it is going to continue to be a place where um, companies and aircraft are registered that are involved in illicit activity, whether or not they're state backed. And that is going to make it very difficult for us to disentangle in many cases what is something that the UAE officially endorses and views as a policy priority and what is something that is happening on their territory, either through negligence, willful or otherwise. Um, so again, not to get into the degree issue, but um, an understanding of how the UAE conducts this kind of activity is important, not just for the Libyan case and not just in terms of talking about integration with forces like uh, support for US adversaries, but also involvement in other uh, civil wars, particularly throughout throughout East Africa. Well, we are bang on time, so I'm afraid we are going to have to, to wrap there. Um, a huge thank you to Candice, to Oliver and Jack for sharing your insights and congratulations again on the report launch. For everyone watching at home, I, I do hope you'll go and check that out. It's available online now.